Some years ago, I had a period where whenever I sat down to practice in my room, I felt stuck with my playing. I could improvise through the changes and make lines, but it didn't really sound the way that I felt it should. It was just a lot of notes and something was really missing. I'd started to realize that while longer eighth note lines work pretty well in a higher tempo, they don't sound nearly as interesting in a medium tempo. And I'd mostly been focusing on getting better eighth note lines by checking out people like Pat Martino and Joe Pass. When I was playing at slower tempos, I wanted a different sound. It felt like the eighth note lines lacked dynamics and it sounded too much like thinking in a tempo where you want to hear more groove and more rhythm. When you're trying to improve something, then most of the work you need to do is to really understand what needs to be fixed. There is a famous Einstein quote where he says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. And that certainly applies to music as well. The better you understand what is wrong, the easier it is to fix it. What I hadn't realized at that point was that I actually had a solution right in front of me. I wanted to get a better idea about what should change. I knew that I wanted to get better at playing phrases that were not bebop lines, but I was stuck only knowing what I didn't want and I needed to figure out what I did want because it doesn't really make sense to practice not doing something. You need to practice doing something that works. So I needed examples of what I wanted the phrases to sound like examples that I could emulate and get some inspiration from. This meant diving into my CD collection because I'm so old that there was no internet and Spotify at that point. Here I ran into a problem. I was looking for people who played fewer notes and still had that sound that I wanted. And I realized that I did not really have a lot of music from people who play like that. It was much more Pass, Martino and Matheny and not as much Jim Hall, Barney Kessel and Charlie Christian. In hindsight, that of course also explains a lot. I did have a lot of Wes Montgomery and that actually came pretty close on a lot of the albums that I really like. He plays a lot of great solos with mostly short statements. So I started to listen and learn solos from Wes, trying to find things that I could make my own. But I also wanted exercises that were more open-ended and could help me develop this. And there was actually one really solid exercise that I was already teaching other people. So maybe just focus on just using the chord tones. I was in the middle of a lesson when I realized that I actually had an exercise that was perfect for this. We were working on improvising over a jazz blues and I told the student to build it up by starting with just soloing with chord tones. For a beginner in jazz, then improvising with chord tones have a lot of advantages. There are only a few notes to think about they are all great on the chord. It's pretty easy to make melodies with an arpeggio and you really learn to hear the harmony when you're soloing. But while I was demonstrating to the student by improvising a solo, I realized that this really connected to what I was trying to teach myself. Because when you have only four notes, then you're not going to play a lot of notes simply because that doesn't really sound great. And if you're playing the arpeggio, you're not going to get lost trying to add material to it that you usually use like upper structure triads, chromatic enclosures or other things that maybe just makes the whole thing more dense. After I was done teaching that day, I immediately sat down to try this out. And it was in many ways a perfect exercise to work with to really improve these things in my playing. And it is actually still an exercise that I find myself returning to fairly often just to really dig into it and get down to the basics and make that stronger. Using this exercise to develop your playing, especially when it comes to rhythm and phrasing, can be seen as a three-step process. Step one, the raw material. So the first thing to do is to choose a song or a progression and then make sure that you have all the arpeggios in one place, like I'm doing here with the first part of Days of Wine and Roses. just to make sure that you have all the arpeggios in one place and to make it easier to go from one chord to the next without having to jump around the neck. But you need to do more than just know where the notes are. They still need to become music. As you can see then for this exercise it's useful to have a full position of the arpeggio because that's going to give you more freedom to be melodic once you start improvising. And I'm sure you already worked on these positions. So here's a place where you can start using that. Step two, refining it. I work with this exercise in two ways. The first is to build vocabulary. So compose licks or improvise slowly. So you can hear that I try to use small two to three note fragments and then either use them as a motif to go from one chord to the next. 
Or use call response so that one phrase is a call and the next is a response. When you work like this, you focus more on making melodies, seeing the connections and how the notes move from one chord to the next, because that's going to help you play stronger melodies and make more interesting solos. And there are some fairly easy ways to work with this. Take this motivic line on F major 7 to E flat 7. Here I'm using the going from F major 7 to E flat 7, then the A and C on F can actually move up to B flat and D flat on the E flat 7. And then I can make that into a nice repeated riff, tying those two chords together. But of course, this is mostly about the notes and becoming better at making sense with short two or three note phrases. So you need to work on the next step as well to get the final ingredient. Step three, the finishing touch. Now you can start to solo in a medium tempo just using the arpeggios. If you have the first two steps down, then this becomes the place where you really start to develop your solos and integrate them into your playing. And this is also where the limitation part of the exercise really starts to pay off. A limitation exercise is an exercise where you limit yourself to focus on improving something specific. With music, you do this all the time and it can be a great way to develop many skills. Think of exercises like a chromatic exercise where you play something really simple to focus on your right hand. In this case, the limitation is that you play the song and improvise over it, but you're only using the arpeggio or the chord tones. And the advantage is that you play fewer notes and you don't have to think too much about what notes you're playing. So you can really focus on the rhythm and how you play those notes, making your solo much more dynamic and more interesting when it comes to rhythm. I guess I had an extra bonus because I was doing this exercise for myself, but also using it with my students. So I could actually practice while I was teaching. This was fixing two of the things in my playing that I really wanted to improve by letting me play shorter phrases and use more interesting rhythms. But I also discovered two other things that I'd never thought about with jazz melodies and bebop lines. The first thing was about rhythm. When it comes to rhythms, then often we think that everything has to be complicated. Odd note groupings, triplets and syncopations. But one thing that I found to be incredibly effective and overlooked was phrasing using quarter notes. Quarter notes are very useful. And if you go back to people that are closer to the swing era, like Charlie Christian and early Jim Hall, then you'll hear a lot of quarter note rhythms as well. Quarter notes often get to work as a type of resolution so that your offbeats sound more interesting as a sort of tension. They're also just a great way to sound more grounded and really connect to the groove and the tempo. The other thing that I discovered improvising like this was that when you improvise eighth note lines, then you rarely repeat notes, mainly because that doesn't sound great in an eighth note line. But if you're improvising with shorter phrases and trying to make melodies that are focused on rhythm and locking in with the groove, then repeating notes is actually a great thing to do. Actually also something you'll hear Wes do quite a lot as well. An important part of learning this is to dig into people who play like this. And Wes Montgomery is a great example of people who really use shorter phrases and get that to work in a great way. You can learn more about his playing and how you can get that into your playing by checking out this video.